good morning to everybody today. We're glad to see you and hope you've had a good week this week. And I want you to turn in your psalm books to page 129, and I ask you all to stand. Excuse me, it's not 129, what is it? 194. I think I messed that up. 194, 194. We're going to sing, is that right, Karen? Am I wrong? Okay, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. Everybody's standing, and I am not able to hit the high notes, so if I could get somebody to hit the high notes. Huh? 194. I don't know where I'm at. I'm not sure if this is a, what church this is, even this morning. We'll be all right. Ask his blessing on the on the service today. Uh, I just pray God will do a wonderful work in all of our hearts. It's so good to see all of you here. And if you're visiting, and I don't know who if you are visiting, but if you're visiting, you sure are welcome here at the house of God. Could I ask Brother Philip, would you ask the Lord's blessing on the service today? Uh, just a few announcements this morning. Uh, first off, on uh, June 30th, we're having an ice cream social. It's uh, on the night service there, so uh, we ask if you want to, just bring out your favorite ice cream, favorite topping, whatever it may be, and we'll all share and have a good time in it. And then July 4th, uh, Brother Jerry Smith will be back uh, for that service. And then July 10th, the ladies are having a craft activity, and it's on a Saturday between 2 and 2 to 4 o'clock. Uh, if you haven't signed up for that, uh, we do still have a sign-up sheet. Uh, actually, I think it's over here in the kitchen now, but uh, sign up for that if you want to be part of that. And again, we do want to thank everybody that were that did come out on Wednesday night for uh, Miss Mona's uh, memorial service. Uh, we really appreciate that, and I know the family and friends of the family really appreciated it as well. And also, we got a couple birthdays down here. Uh, we got Miss Jenna, who's on the 27th. And we got uh, Tanner, is on the 29th. And Brother Frazee's on July 3rd. And then a couple anniversaries. We got Miss Dirk, Miss Tiffany, on June 28th. And I think he turned 40 this 
past week as well too. So when you give him a hard time when he gets back. He said he was leaving, so nobody would give him a hard time. So he wasn't going to be around his parents, his grandparents, his in-laws, nobody. That way they wouldn't give him a hard time about it. So I thought about would you just decorate the church in all black and all that whenever he comes back. And just not. <laughs> <laughs> but we do. We need to give him a hard time. Uh, also, uh, Dan and Sue McGill, uh, July 1st is their anniversary. So if you see any of these, if you can, just uh, wish them happy birthday and happy anniversary as well. And I think that's it. Ask you to stand one more time, and we're going to be on page 324. 324, draw me nearer. And I think about somebody turning 40, you don't have to give them a hard time. Old age is going to do that for you, <laughs> they'll never be the same. Draw me nearer. Everybody sing out. Brother Dave, if you would ask the Lord's blessing on the offering. seated. This is our last Sunday here with you. Uh, I just, uh, we, things have gone pretty good, except we've had one murder 
uh, since we've been here, I have killed the song service. So uh, <laughs> otherwise, things are going by pretty good, pretty good. Well, page 139, let's just stay seated there. 139, just stay where you are seated, and um, we'll sing this song. I love this song. Paul, in the book of 2 Timothy, these, this is where this came from. One thing, he, he was, Paul was sure of a lot of things in his Christian life. But the number one thing was he knew who saved him. He was sure of his salvation. I love this song. Let's sing verse 1 and verse number 5. sure is a joy again to be back with you and and if I don't get to uh, see you again after today if you're not here uh, tonight or Wednesday night I do want to say thank you so much for making uh, Karen and me feel so welcome uh, for the time we've been here now you know brother Jerry Smith and I we have uh, two things that are not in common uh, one is he has gray hair and and the second one is he can sing and so that's the way it is and that's you get what you you know you take what you get, but it has truly truly been a joy. You all have made it so so easy for us to be here. You've taken such good care of us, and we do thank you uh, for that. I want you to go with me in your Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter number eleven, verse number twenty eight. Matthew chapter number eleven, verse twenty eight. Um, I still haven't gotten to that ten minute message that I promised. I came close Wednesday night. If you were here Wednesday night, I came real close. Um, probably won't make it again this morning, but. In verse number, uh, verse number 28 of the book of Matthew, chapter number 11, we have here what I've entitled the greatest invitation. The greatest invitation. There are some preachers, I've never been able to do that, but there's some preachers that just can give an invitation. They, they you know the plea, the way they conduct an invitation. I've never been one that's been able to do that very well. In Africa, when we were there, we couldn't give an invitation like we have here uh, because uh, I tried it when, with the first church that I started and found out I had a few problems uh, because if you say, how many want to go to heaven when, I mean, no, excuse me, uh, if you want to uh, receive the Lord as your Savior, uh, raise your hand, everybody raise their hand, you know, uh, they, they just didn't know how to respond. And if you say, if you want to be saved, come forward, everybody come forward. I, I just had to be careful about giving an invitation. So what I would do there is I would say, we would sing a final song and I would have them bow their heads and I'd say, if you want to, if you would like to talk to us about the Lord, about how to know that you can be saved and how you can know to, um, about how to go to heaven, then all, all you have to do is stay after service and we'll deal with you. And so we would take a half hour, hour, however long it took, and we would deal with them just to make sure they understood. So I'm not sure about how to give an invitation, but here's what I found, that it doesn't matter what preacher gives the invitation. If the Holy Spirit doesn't give the invitation to a person's heart, it's not going to work anyway. Um, he deals with our hearts. He draws us. But this is the world, this is the greatest invitation that we can find in the Word of God that i found, and I want to talk about that today. But before we get into the message, before I have you stand and, and, and read that verse, I have a confession to make. I've already told the ladies over here, I have a confession. 
I've been picking on the kids, you know, the young people. I say, you know, let God have your life and, and let him give you the person that you want, uh, that God wants you to have and not for you to pick out that young man or that young lady. And I mean, that's truly what I mean. But I'm, the confession is, uh, uh, is, as I talk about, you may, you know, somebody's got to marry some of these ugly guys. I've got 10 grandchildren, five boys and five girls, not one, not one of my grandchildren want to look like me not one. And I want you to pray for me because that's hurting my feelings so badly. But uh, not one of my grandchildren want to look like me. Not, uh, they're all, all going to look like me, but <laughs> eventually even the girls are going bald. But anyway, uh, we have a great family. But I did want to tell one story. I love, I love mar you know, marriage story, you know, stories about marriage and stuff like that. Well, there was this young man that went to his dad and said, Dad, I want to marry her so badly but my feet stink. And he said, son, that's not a problem. He said, uh, just wear your socks to bed every night and everything will be great. Well, the young lady goes to her mom and says, mama, I love him so much, I wanna marry him, but my breath is so bad. And she said, darling, that's not a problem. Just before your husband gets up, you go, you gargle, brush your teeth and all that and everything will be fine. So they get married. Every night he wears his socks and every morning she gets her up early, brushes her teeth and gargles. I mean, two weeks of honeymoon bliss is just wonderful. Well, one morning before his wife got up, the husband wakes up. The room reeks like something he's never smelled before. And he realizes his sock is off. One of his socks is off. So he said, oh goodness, I gotta get my sock on. So he's trying to find his sock and he's, when he's moving around trying to find his sock, he bumps into his wife she leans over and says, what's the matter, dear? He said, oh, I think you swallowed one of my socks. <laughs> so, so, anyway, it can happen. Just be sure to do what you need to do. Matthew chapter number 11, would you stand with me for just a moment? Matthew chapter number 11. I'll go ahead and read. I'm going, to, I'm going to go ahead and read all three verses because they all go together. They're all tied together. Uh, we're only going to be dealing with verse number 28. So 28, 29, and 30 of Matthew chapter number 11. The Bible says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And let's pray again, Father, we do thank you for the precious word of God. Thank you that one day the Holy Spirit of God gave me an invitation to come to Christ. And I'm so glad that the Lord Jesus was there waiting for me as the Holy Spirit drew me. I'm so glad that we have salvation in Christ. And I'm so glad that we know whom we have believed. And we're persuaded that you are able to keep us. And I thank you for the promise of salvation, the security of salvation. Thank you for all that we have in you today. And there could be one that's here today. They're struggling maybe with the assurance of their salvation, struggling with this thing of knowing that when they die, they're going to go to heaven. And Father, the greatest question that could ever be asked is what must I do to be saved? And I'm so glad for the answer that Paul gave to the Philippian jailer. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Would you please have your way in our hearts and our lives today? And for us who are saved, help us to consider all that we have in Christ Jesus, the free gift that we've been able to experience in knowing that this is just a foretaste of glory divine when we stand before you. So please have your way. Please have your way with my mind to help me to be able to communicate exactly what you'd have me to say today. And would you please be with our hearts to receive what the Spirit would say to us. And we thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. You know, the, um, in the book of Matthew, the Lord Jesus is presented in the book of Matthew as the king of the Jews. And as king of the Jews, he is presented to the nation of Israel. And, of course, we know the nation of Israel rejected him. I've had people say, well, what if, 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 if the Jewish people had not rejected Christ and he had not gone to the cross? Can I tell you, the Lord Jesus came into this world to die on the cross. But he was presented to the nation of Israel. But the nation of Israel rejected him. But what I love about this is now we see that the plan of God, this is the plan of God all, the way, all along, by the way. 
The plan of God for salvation is personal. The plan, the gospel is the message to the entire world. God wants the whole world to be saved. So it is a worldwide invitation, the gospel message. But I'm glad that it is personal. That the night that I was saved, that the night that, or the, the day that I was saved, I heard the gospel, got under conviction on a, on a week night at a revival. But I didn't get saved till about a year later at, when I went to church. I was the only one at that little church when I got saved, the only one that got saved that morning. And I'm so glad that you can be saved anywhere because it's personal. But here, when I look in the Word of God, the Bible tells me in Romans chapter number 19, verse number 10, this is what the Word of the Lord is. The Lord Jesus himself, when he's standing there with Zacchaeus at that tree, and he said, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Every miracle that the Lord performed, every message that he preached, everything that the Lord Jesus did was to point to him in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection. The purpose for him coming into this world was not just to heal people. Everything that he did was for the cross, pointing to the cross. And finally, three and a half, uh, 33 and a half years later, he went to the cross, to the cross of Calvary. And so when I think about how that the revelation of Christ, the revelation of God coming into this world, that's what brought Christ to us, born in that stable, God becoming flesh, that glory of God draped about, that brought him into this world, his purpose for coming to die on that cross, because he had to be a man to die. He had to be a man to die. But he was God that came out of that grave. But when I come to Matthew chapter number 11, verse number 28, here is this invitation. See, he, that revelation brought him to us, but it's the invitation that brings us to him. The invitation. We have a lot of people that go through life and they think when they die, just because they've been good enough, they're going to get to go to heaven. I'm sorry to tell you that that is not going to be the way it will be. It's because you have had a personal relationship with Christ on this earth. This is our time. This is why we're alive, that we have time to receive Christ. This is our moment that we can come to Christ. But if a person rejects, rejects, and rejects, and, re and dies lost, they have blown their opportunity. They have wasted, and they have squandered the, the privilege that God would have given to them to have become a child of God. So here's the invitation that he gives to us in chapter number 11 of Matthew, verse 20, 28. Look at this. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Number one, I want to talk about the necessity. What is the, what is the purpose? What is the reason? Why do we need this invitation? Well, I, I look at that verse of Scripture. Look what he says. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Now, let me look at those words backwards for just a moment. The, the word heavy laden means to be heavily loaded, to be heavily, heavily loaded. Did you know that this world, everybody that's ever been born in this world after Adam sinned, they are loaded with sin. Now you take a little baby, I, I mentioned this the other night, even a little baby, you don't have to teach a baby to sin, they automatically sin, come out, they, they're little liars, in my kids were that way, little babies laying there, they nothing wrong with them, they're just crying, want you to hold them, and you think they're dying, and that's the way I felt. When my kids were a little bitty, I, I could give you a few things that happened with my kids and me, when my kids were babies, I'm not, you'll get all, y'all get sick and leave the building, but, but anyway, you know, my children were that way, nothing wrong with them, but when, when they start crying, what's wrong, what's wrong, I didn't know what was going on with them, but can I tell you, as we go on in life, and I think about a little child, they don't have the load of sin that an adult would have, you think about, a, you think about an adult, or a teenager in this world, and you think about all the things that we can get into, well, a little child doesn't have that. You take a child six, seven, eight, nine years old, they may not have had the same collision with sin as an older person would have, but yet they are loaded with sin. I think about a teenager loaded with sin. I think about an adult loaded with sin. The measure of the load may be different. The weight of the load may be different, but they're still loaded with sin. As I mentioned, I think a few weeks ago, God, when God created man, he created Adam, Adam and Eve without any sin. He did not create them to have sin or to have to carry sin. 
We are laden with sin, and it is there, and our maximum load, maximum load limit for sin is zero. People cannot handle sin. Why the bars? Why the drugs? Why all of these things that people do? It is an escape. They, they want to get away from everything that sin is to them and that what sin has done to them. Why? We can't handle it. Why suicide? Our son said since COVID or before COVID, they would might have a suicide in Quebec, Canada, in the city they live. They may have one suicide a month. He said they're having a suicide once, one a week now since COVID came. People cannot handle the pressures that sin has brought. There's three things about sin. Number one, when I think about this load of sin, there is a grip that sin has on us that we cannot break. This change that sin has got us bound with. I wish there was a way that I could find out how to get a key of my own doing and unlock this chain and break the chain, get it off of me. But can I tell you, it is a grip that I will never be able to break. Number two, there is a grief that I have with my sin that I can never conquer. I think about how lives are destroyed because of sin. I think about moms and dads. I think about children today. Who, don't, who are growing up without a mom or a dad because sin has taken them away from them, living in drugs and all the filthiness and all the things that this world has. There is a grief that goes with sin, a grief. I think about there is a guilt that goes with sin. The thing that happened to me that morning that I got saved was I was loaded with guilt. Man, I, I, and I told you the other night when I was preaching or maybe it was, maybe it was at Miss Mona's funeral or a memorial service, um, I knew God could save. I just didn't think he would save me because I knew what I was. And that was that load of guilt. And everybody has the grip of sin. Everybody is bound by sin. You can't get away from it. You can't get out of it. Everybody's got the sorrow that comes with sin, this grief that we have. And everybody has got the guilt of their sin. When I think about people carrying guilt and the suicide rate and all that goes with it, I wish there was a way that I could say, get rid of me, get rid of me, get rid of me. But there's no way I can get rid of sin's guilt that comes upon me. And this grief and guilt and all that's there, you know what, is my choice. A lot of people say, well, you know, I'm just paying for Adam's sin. I'm just paying for what he did. The Bible tells me in the book of Romans, chapter number 5, wherefore as by one man, and, and i got to tell you, this is where it all started, wherefore, wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world, before Adam sinned, there had never been sin in this world. But when Adam sinned, sin came by Adam. He's the original blame of it all. Wherefore, as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world and death. We're all, we're all dying. From the day you're born, you're, you're, dying, you're, you're living to die. We're all dying. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered, into, uh, sin entered into the world and death by sin. So death is passed upon all men. We're all sinners. So we want to blame Adam. But you know how Paul finishes up that verse of Scripture? Chapter number 5 of the book of Romans, verse number 12. He finishes, finishes it up by saying, For that all have sinned. Yeah, Adam, originally, he's the blame. He's the reason for it. But I can't blame Adam for my sin. Just, just like I can't blame my mom and dad for my sin. And I can't blame you for my sin. And you can't blame me for your sin. We are all responsible for our own sin. Own sin. The Bible tells me in the book of Hebrews chapter number 11 that there is pleasure in sin. If there wasn't any pleasure in it, why would people sin? There's pleasure. You see the billboards, you see the advertisements, all of it is out in front of us. It's flashing, it's, gl it's glittering, it's glamour at us. There is pleasure in sin. But here's what he goes on to say, for a season. A season, that means a period of time that is short-lived. A period of time, it has a beginning and it has an end. When that pleasure begins, you can rest assured that that pleasure will end one day. And it's going to end in tragedy one day. So why is this, why is this invitation necessary? He says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. Let me tell you what's necessary for me and why it was necessary for me. Because I was loaded with sin and there was nothing I could do about it. 18, I was almost 19 years of age when I got saved. Now, let me tell you something. I was loaded with sin. The grip and the guilt, all of it had a hold of me and I couldn't break it. But not only is that we see the world is laden or loaded with sin, but look at the word laboring. 
He says, come unto me, all ye that labor. And I go, okay, what are people trying, what are they laboring? What are they working for? What, because in this invitation, they're working, what are they working for? They're working to get rid of the sin. When I look at a man by the name of Adam, you know, Adam and what he did in the Garden of Eden, when, remember, he sinned against the Lord and, they, and he and Eve were there. And the Bible says that they made themselves fig leaves, of clothes of fig leaves. Why? They were desperate. Why? Because they knew God was becoming. God, he had a habit of coming into the garden and fellowshipping with Adam, with Adam and Eve before they sinned. And he would come and he would, they would fellowship. And then in chapter number three, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, here the Lord comes. They hear the voice of the Lord in the garden coming. And I thought, have you ever seen a voice? Have you ever seen a voice? Have you, ever, have you ever seen a voice walking? I love what John chapter number one, verse number one says. In the beginning was the what? The Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. You know what I believe? I believe it was none other than the pre-incarnate Christ, the Word walking in the garden. What was he doing? He was coming for fellowship. Now, the Lord already knew that what they had done but he wanted them to understand what they had done. And when they heard the voice of the Lord in the garden, what did they do out of desperation? They hid themselves. They didn't want the Lord to see them like they saw themselves. So they made the fig leaves out of desperation. They were working to cover up what sin had done to them. I go to his son, his name is Cain. When the Lord had commanded and demanded a blood sacrifice that we see happen in the book of Genesis chapter number 3, after they sinned, God killed the animals, clothed them with the skins, which was the shed blood for, their, uh, for the atonement of their sin, for the redemption of their sin. We see God made the way for them. And from that point on, there has always been the shedding of blood until the Lord Jesus came. And then he shed his blood. And now we have no need for animals to be killed anymore. No more shedding of animal blood. Christ shed his blood. That paid the price for all of our sin. But here's a man by the name of Cain, and he says, you know what? I don't like God's way. I'm going to do my way. You know what he was? He was a farmer. He had a garden. I mean, back in those days, can you imagine the watermelon? Karen and I bought a little watermelon. Good night. Open that thing up. You got two or three scoops in the watermelon. Can you imagine the watermelons back in the Garden of Eden coming out? I mean, awesome. Well, he brings all these fruits and vegetables to God. I believe he brought the best he had. You know what the problem was? It wasn't good enough. It wasn't good enough. You know why? Because it's not what God said for him to bring. So we have men today that are laboring of their own effort to try to get rid of the sin that they've got. So what are they doing? In their desperation, they're saying, I got to work. People will tell me, I got to work. I don't care what religion you name. I don't care if it's a Baptist. I don't care what. If there is a group of people, if there is a preacher, if there is somebody that stands up and says, you got to do something in order to be saved. That is a work salvation. That means you're working, you're laboring. But here, I got a question for me, for you. If I got to do something, how much I got to do? They always tell you what you got to do, but they don't tell you how much you got to do. Okay, if I got to give money, you tell me when I've given enough. Okay, is it a dollar? Is it a million? How much I ought to give? If, if, I, if I've got to crawl on my knees, how far I got to crawl? If I've got to go to church, how many times I got to go to church? If I got to do, you got to, no, if you got to shed all these tears and you got to light these candles, tell me how much I got to do. You know what the problem is? They can't tell you. You know why? Because they are not the ones that were offended, offended by my sin. You got to go to the one that's been offended. You got to go to God. Lord, I have failed you. I have sinned. I've offended you. I've trespassed against you. What do I have to do? You got to go to the one who's been offended. Ask him what you got to do. And he'll tell you what you got to do. The man can't tell you what you got to do. They, don't, they will never tell you how, when it's been enough. Well, you can stop now. Everything is okay. You can go to heaven because you've done enough. You've paid enough. You've given enough. You've crawled enough. You've cried enough. You've gone enough. They cannot tell you because it was not them that had been offended. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. 
A lot of people say, well, if you'll keep the Ten Commandments, that'll work. Did you know there's a whole lot more to God's law than Ten Commandments? The Ten Commandments, I, I like them. The Ten Commandments are ten nails. Ten nails. And um, on these ten nails, God hung over 600 laws, statutes, ordinances. Over 600. See, some people just say 10. Well, let's just leave it at 10. David didn't keep the Ten Commandments. Moses didn't keep the, keep the Ten Commandments. And he's the one that went up on the mountain for God to give them to. Nobody's been able to take, keep the Ten Commandments. But let's, let's go back. He said over 600 of them. But James says in the book of James, chapter number 2, if you break one, you're guilty of all of them. Just one. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will keep you rest. So God has told me, if I want to go to heaven by my works, here's what you got to do. You keep the law. The problem is, I cannot keep it. You cannot keep it. Nobody can keep the law. So I cannot get to heaven, cannot get to God by what I do, by my works. It will not work. So number one, the necessity. Number two, the possibility of the invitation. Is this invitation even possible? Is it possible for a person? He says, come. That's an invitation, come. But he didn't just say, come. He says, come unto me. Is it possible for a sinner with all of his sin to come to a holy God? Well, I've got to tell you, if God said to do it, I think that's pretty much means you can do it. It means it's possible. So I think about, let me give you an illustration. I think about a woman by the name of Esther. Did you ever read the story of, of Esther in the Bible? This is a wonderful story. And because of a man by the name of Haman, all the Jews are going to be killed, every one of them. And Mordecai tells Esther, who is now the queen, she's a Jew, but Mordecai the Jew tells Esther, the queen, the Jew, go before Ahasuerus, the, this heathen king, and tell him who you are and to spare our lives. And he, she said, I can't go to that king because anybody that goes to the king without having been invited to come before the king you will die. Well, she goes in. She said, I'm going to do it. So she puts on her best garment. She fixes every hair in place, which I don't know how to do. But every hair is in place and her best garment. She goes in knowing that any instant she's going to die. The problem with Esther was going before a, a king who did not sin for her, who did not give her the invitation, and she could be guilty of death. He was unapproachable. But let me give this story about another person whose name is Mephibosheth. I am so glad the Lord, excuse me, that my mama didn't name me Mephibosheth. My four-letter name, Dean, was bad enough. I, sometimes when I'm typing, instead of putting D-E-A-N, I put D-E-N-A. And I just, before I send my email or my tech, I will catch myself. Wait a second. I don't want them to think Dana has emailed them something, you know. But Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was a pauper. Mephibosheth was crippled. Mephibosheth had everything going against him. At one time, he had everything going for him because he was the son, the grandson of a king. The problem with Mephibosheth, he was down there in Lodabar, and here comes some men up one day from the king, and they said, hey, we're going to take you back to the king. You know what the problem was with Mephibosheth? It wasn't the problem. The king wasn't the problem. The king invited him. The problem was Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was who he was. Back in those days, the, the son of a former king that was not of the same family, you know what they did to him? Killed them all. Killed them, everyone. Mephibosheth thinks they're bringing him back up to Jerusalem, and David's going to kill him. But David didn't want to kill him. He's getting ready to forgive him, to accept him. So in one case, you've got a king you can't go before because he's too great and too mighty and too powerful. On the other hand, you've got a man that's too poor, too wicked, too whatever, and he, can't get, he won't come to the king. So you've got one that can't go to the king, the other that won't go to the king. So what are you going to do? Well, can I tell you? In the Lord, we got everything. we got, number one, a God that you cannot approach to. we got sinners that can't get to him. So what did he do? He sent a man, Christ Jesus, the God-man. And what did he do? He got a hold of that unapproachable God, holy and high, because the Lord Jesus himself is holy and he's God. 
and he, he touched man. He came into this world as man without sin. You know what he did? He brought the two together. The possibility is, is that anybody can get saved if they come through God's way, which is the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross at Calvary to pay for our sins. Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy, heavy laden. The possibility is that a person can be saved if they will trust Christ as their personal Savior. And then last of all, the tragedy of the invitation. Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You know, I think about the Lord Jesus, and I like the word rest here. The word rest means that I have surrendered in the war, and I'm at rest. I surrendered when the war was going on. I surrendered to the King, the Lord Jesus Christ, as my personal Savior, and the war is over. The, 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 the word rest means that I have stopped my efforts, and I've received the, Savior as my, uh, the Lord as my Savior, and now I'm at rest. I have surrendered. I have stopped, and I'm at rest. Come unto me, all you that have laid, and I will give you rest. I remember when I bowed before the Lord that day as an 18-year-old, August the 1st, 1971. A lot of people say, you have to know when you were saved. You've got to remember the date or you're not saved. And there's a lot of people who didn't. What I did when I got saved, I wrote the date down in my Bible. And that's how I remember August the 1st, 1971. And a lot of people say, if you don't remember the date you were saved, don't, you, you're not saved. Here's what I say. If you don't remember the date you were saved, use my date. Y'all, I don't, you know, just say I was saved August the 1st, 1971. I know you probably weren't born back then, but it doesn't matter. If you've got to have it, use my date. I don't care. August the 1st, 1971 is the day I received the Lord Jesus as my, as my Savior. And when I bowed there that day, and I trusted Christ as my Savior, can I tell you what happened? In an instant. It wasn't kind of a progressive thing. I mean, in, just like that. When I believed that he would save me. It was like I had never experienced anything like that in my life. You know that guilt I was talking about a minute ago? All that, all that, all that stuff, it was gone. I mean, I felt like this, you know, when you go down there. You, honestly, you truly feel that way. You feel you're bound. You're stooped over. You're just like a captive. And, and, and in an instant, it was as though I could have floated out the building. In an instant, the guilt that I felt and all those things that were on me, it was gone. Liberty. Everything was gone. And he says in the invitation, I will give you rest. And I experienced it that day. Oh, an amazing thing. I will never experience that again because it only happens once in your life. That's all that has to happen, once in your life. But every day it's free. Him in Christ every day, it's rest in Him every day. But I'll never forget it. The, the first, that very moment that it happened to me. But here's the tragedy the tragedy is, is there's a lot of people in this world who will never hear the invitation. Have you ever, have you ever witnessed to somebody who had never heard the gospel? Never one time. Karen and I have had the privilege in Africa of dealing with people who not one time ever heard the old, old story. Never one time ever got saved. Never, or excuse me, never heard one time that Jesus loved him. Never one time. And see the transformation. The sad thing is, is there are many, many multitudes of people who will never hear unless somebody gives them a track or knocks on their door or shares Christ. They'll never hear. That's a tragedy. Because, would you look at verse number 28? He says, come unto me. Now look at this next word. What is the next three-letter word? all. Aren't you glad that everybody can be saved? There's nobody excluded. Everybody can be, but they got to hear. And that's a tragedy that there are people that will never hear. They're going to die lost who have never heard the gospel. But can I tell you an even greater tragedy than that? The tragedy is that there are people who have heard and they've heard and they've heard and they've heard and they've put off and they've rejected and they've said no and they said, wait, not now. And they've heard, and they've said no. The tragedy is, is just as there are, there are those who will be in hell who never heard, there are going to be there, those in hell who have heard, and heard, and heard. And they will know that they never had to go there had they only believed, had they, had they only rejected when you read the book of Revelation, chapter number 
21, just after the great white throne judgment, he talks about the new Jerusalem. He talks about the glory of the new Jerusalem. That's our home, by the way, that we're going to see one day. But he talks about the people who are not going to be there. He lists sorcerers. We were talking about that Wednesday night. Sorcerers, which has to do with pharmaceutical, which has to do with drugs and all that those things do. And he talks about the abominable. That, those are the people that send up a, an odor in the nostrils of God, the stench of the sin of their life. They're not going to be there. All these people. But you know who the first two people mentioned of that long list of bad things, of, of people who are wicked, wicked, wicked sinners? The first one are the fearful. Fearful. Think about somebody sitting on a pew, and they're there. They hear the gospel. They know they're a sinner. They know that Christ is the only way to God. They know that Christ died on the cross for their sins, and he rose again. They know all of that, but they will not come because they're afraid of what somebody's going to think. They're afraid of what somebody's going to say. Hell is going to be full of people that have gotten saved. They've not been afraid of what somebody thought. The night that I heard the gospel, when I truly understood the gospel, as about 500 people there that night when that girl invited me to go, the girl I had gone to high school with invited me to go to church to her revival to help her win a Bible, sitting on the back row back there. I didn't go forward because my friend David was sitting beside me. The girl that invited me, Shirley, was sitting right over there. And there were 500 people sitting there, and I didn't budge. I grabbed that pew and I held on. I did not go because I was afraid what people would think of me. I'm glad that a little over a year later I did get saved, but hell was full of, a people, full of people that are afraid. The second word is the word unbelieving. Those who do not believe, those are the people that know. They know the truth. They know the gospel. They know they're a sinner. They know they've heard it and they've heard it and they're sick of it. My own brother told me, don't ever. My own brother told me, don't you ever mention him to me again. My brother and his friend already planned if one died before the other, don't allow them to have a service in church. They don't, want to, they don't want to have a funeral. They don't want no preacher getting up over them. They don't want nothing to do with God even after they're dead. They want nothing to do with God. My own brother told me, don't you ever talk to me again. I didn't talk to him again, but I wrote him a, I wrote him a two-page testimony I let, we, were all, we were both living at home. He was 19, I was 18. I slipped it under his pillow. I never, heard him, I never heard a word of what he did with it. Don't know to this day what he did with that letter. But I know two weeks later, my brother came in one night. I was already home from church, and my brother came in, and he came toward me. I thought he was getting ready to pop me in the mouth. I didn't know what he was going to do. And he grabbed me, and he said, Now I know what you're talking about. Because he said, I was saved tonight. And he tell you, there's going to be a multitude of people in hell because they did not believe they rejected they rejected and they rejected and they died lost but can I tell you all of us here are here today this room is full of a lot of people that were afraid one day they did not believe one day but there's a bunch of us here today they didn't let fear stop them Brother Kent, I was sitting in the pew right behind you in the church I was saved in four rows back. And fear didn't stop me. Unbelief didn't stop me. And if you're here today and you don't know Christ, don't let anything stop you. Brother Andy here's a big man. Don't let his size. Luke sitting over here is a big guy. I'm on their side. Don't let them or anybody don't let a person stop you. But you come and trust Christ as your Savior. Come unto me, all ye who labor and heavy laden. I will give you rest. I will give you rest. Let's stand to our feet. Our heads are bowed. As Karen comes to the piano, our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. Wonderful invitation. The necessity of it. We need it. The possibility of it. We can be saved. All can be saved. The tragedy is people rejecting, people not hearing. 
And as you're here today, if you are not sure of your salvation, and I wouldn't do or say anything. There are some preachers that try to make you doubt your salvation. I would not do that for anything in the world. But if you are here maybe having doubts, you can get it settled today. Our, our doubts and fears are all settled in Him. And you can come this morning, trust Christ as your Savior, or just come and get assurance of your salvation if you are saved. But He has the answer for all of your problems today. Father, as we come before you, thank you for the privilege that we have to be in the house of God. Thank you for the precious word of God, the assurance of our salvation. It is not in how we felt the day that we were saved. It's not in the words that we tried to say. Our assurance is not in our memory, trying to remember all that we said or did. Our assurance is in the word of God that we did what God's word said for us to do. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Please have your way, I pray. Speak to all of our hearts in a wonderful way in Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Miss Karen plays one verse of